Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to Eventive's 2024 Second Quarter Results Conference Call. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. Members of the investment community will have the opportunity to ask questions and can join the queue at any time by pressing star 1. For members of the media attending in a listen-only mode today, you may quote statements made by any of the Oventive representatives. However, members of the media who wish to quote others who are speaking on this call today, we advise you to contact those individuals directly to obtain their consent. Please be advised that this conference call may not be recorded or be broadcast without the express consent of Oventive. I would now like to turn the conference call over to Jason Verheist from Investor Relations. Please go ahead, Mr. Verheist. Thanks, Joanna, and welcome everyone to our second quarter conference call. This call is being webcast and the slides are available on our website at, at ovintive.com. Please take note of the advisory regarding forward-looking statements at the beginning of our slides and in our disclosure documents filed on EDGAR and CDAR+. Following prepared remarks will be available to take your questions. I will now turn the call over to our President and CEO, Brendan McCracken. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. We announced another strong quarter yesterday. We're pleased to continue our track record of industry-leading execution. Most importantly, we continue to be relentless at converting our execution into bottom-line financial results and delivering superior and durable returns for our shareholders. We've been seeing the benefits of our culture of innovation showing up in our results for quite some time now. We're on track to generate 60% more free cash flow per share this year largely because of the efficiency gains and value creation that our innovations have unlocked. For us, innovation is more than simply applying the latest technology to our operations. It is a mindset within our organization. It influences the way we approach challenges and manage complex operational objectives. We've been very deliberate in our efforts to cultivate this over time, and it is delivering tangible results. Ensuring the durability of returns requires a deep inventory of premium drilling locations. Our multi-year strategy of both organic and inorganic inventory extension has added about 1,650 premium locations to our portfolio, delivering a huge boost to our full cycle returns and the durability of our business. The combination of execution, inventory depth, and capital discipline is driving the strong capital efficiency you see in our business today and it is showing up in our financial results as we make sure our operational gains flow through to higher returns. We are raising our annual production guidance once again, and we remain on track to generate approximately $1.9 billion of free cash flow, even as realized prices are settling lower than last quarter. We delivered net earnings of $340 million and cash flow of just over a billion dollars, beating consensus estimates. Our cash flow beat was driven by both production and cost outperformance, as we exceeded the top end of our production guidance ranges on both oil and natural gas, and we came in at the bottom end of the guidance range on combined TMP and LOE costs. We generated free cash flow of $403 million, 60% of which we will return to our shareholders through our base dividend and share buybacks during the third quarter. With our increased production guide, we're set to deliver more production for the same amount of capital. Our full-year oil and condensate volumes will average about 208,000 barrels a day, while our capital guidance midpoint is unchanged at $2.3 billion. This is 8,000 barrels a day higher than our original 2024 outlook. Our 2024 program is repeatable in 25 and beyond allowing us to sustain approximately 205,000 barrels a day of oil and condensate production with capital investment of about $2.3 billion for the next 7 to 10 years, assuming flat commodity prices. This outcome reflects our leading capital efficiency and the depth of our premium inventory. I'll now turn the call over to Corey. Thanks, and good morning. As Brendan mentioned, we had a very strong operational performance in the second quarter, with every item coming in at or better than our second quarter guidance midpoints. Total production came in above the high end of guidance, averaging 594,000 BOEs per day, 
We achieved this while coming in below the midpoint on capital. Crude and condensate production was strong across all four assets in the quarter. Permian, Uinta, and Anadarko crude and condensate levels were all above our internal expectations, and the Montney demonstrated significant outperformance of about 4,000 barrels per day ahead of plan. Our track record of shareholder returns continued through the quarter. We returned $262 million through share buybacks of $182 million and base dividends of $80 million. This represents a competitive cash return yield of approximately 8%. Since the inception of our buyback program in the third quarter of 2021 through the second quarter of 2024, we've repurchased 37 million shares and distributed approximately 800 million in base dividend payments for total shareholder returns of about 2.5 billion. In the third quarter, as per our shareholder returns framework, we will pay dividends of approximately $80 million while repurchasing shares worth 162 million and allocating 162 million to the balance sheet. We reduced debt by more than 100 million during the quarter and our 12-month trailing leverage ratio was 1.2 times. We continue to make progress towards optimizing our capital structure, decreasing our leverage, and reducing interest expense. We have lowered our go-forward quarterly interest expense guidance by $10 million to reflect our lower debt levels. We remain committed to our mid-cycle leverage target of one times, or about $4 billion of debt, assuming mid-cycle prices. The maturity profile of our bonds will allow us to optimize our debt paydown schedule over the next couple of years as we work towards that target. Our continuous improvement in capital efficiency will allow us to generate additional cash flow and reach our debt target sooner. This bolsters the resiliency of our business and enables us to withstand market volatility. We remain investment grade rated with a stable outlook from all four credit rating agencies. Capital efficiency remains a primary focus for us as we work to efficiently convert our inventory into cash flow and generate consistent, durable returns for our shareholders. Assuming full-year average crude prices of $80 WTI oil and a NYMEX natural gas price of $2.25, we are on track to generate about $1.9 billion of free cash flow. This is about $750 million more than last year. Third quarter production is set to average between 565 and 580,000 BOEs per day, with oil and condensate volumes of about 206,000 barrels per day at the midpoint. We expect third quarter capital investment to come in around 550 million at the midpoint, and we remain very comfortable with the midpoint of our full year guide at 2.3 billion. We also updated our cash tax guidance for the year with expectations of lower cash taxes. In the U.S., this is driven by greater certainty around certain tax attributes from last year's Permian acquisition. In Canada, lower natural gas prices resulted in a lower cash tax outlook. Additionally, as we mentioned last quarter, the resolution of a legacy legal matter will result in one-time recovery of approximately $150 million that we plan to allocate to debt reduction. We expect to receive the cash in late 3Q and 4Q with minimal cash tax impact. Between this and the roll-off of our Rex pipeline commitment in May, we will realize about $250 million of cash savings this year from the cleanup of legacy items. I'll now turn the call over to Greg, who will speak to our operational highlights. Thanks, Corey, and good morning. Our second quarter well performance was strong across the portfolio. In particular, we saw strong well productivity in the Permian, where we produced oil and condensate volumes of 123,000 barrels per day. With the addition of our previously planned sixth rig in the play, our second quarter turn-in lines totaled 42 gross wells, approximately double the number of wells we brought on in the first quarter. As you can see in the chart on slide 10, the wells are tracking above our 2024 type curve. The dashed line on the chart shows all of the 122 wells we've brought online since the fourth quarter. As you can see, our well performance continues to paint the 2024 type curve, which is higher than our 2023 well results, incorporating all of the improved well productivity we achieved last year. We remain fully confident in our ability to deliver our 24 type curve in the Permian, which is unchanged from the start of the year. These gains are hard fought and the result of multiple stacked innovations. As our industry continues to mature, We expect to see a divergence in well performance between those operators who embrace innovation and technical complexities 
and those who continue to pursue the status quo. We continually push the boundaries of the efficiency frontier to execute our programs faster and with less capital, making the business more profitable. The same group of wells that exceeded our type curve for productivity also delivered some impressive pace setter results on drilling and completions in addition to well cost. We drilled our fastest well in the quarter, a 10,500 foot lateral, in less than six days. When looking at our program average, our Permian drilling speed in the first half of the year was roughly 10% faster than our 2023 program. On completions, our fastest second quarter pad average was about 4,800 feet per day. To put this in perspective, that equates to pumping just over 14 million pounds of sand per day. Our year-to-date trimal fract wells were completed about 30% faster than our average speed in 2023 at an industry-leading 4,200 feet per day. On a total program basis, year-to-date, we've completed roughly 20% more feet per day than our 2023 program average. These cycle time improvements mean that we continue to drive our well costs lower. Our pace setting Permian well, an 11,500 foot lateral, had a DNC cost of about $600 per foot, in line with the lowest well cost in the basin. Some of our longer laterals have delivered, delivered even better cost performance. Oventive remains an industry leader in the Midland Basin in several key categories, including trimal frac, wet sand, drilling speed, supply chain, and logistics management. Our outstanding performance is driving the strong capital efficiency you see in our business today. We also continue to see top drilling and completions metrics in the Montney, where in the first half of the year, we delivered an average of 1,750 feet drilled per day and over 4,275 feet completed per day, a speed similar to our trimal frac averages in the Permian. The Montney. The Montney has the lowest well cost in the portfolio, and our team delivered a pace setter DNC well cost of less than 500 feet per quarter. Sorry, $500 per foot in the quarter. We are also bringing on some highly productive wells. During the quarter, our 11 well 15 of 28 pipestone pad delivered initial rates well above expectations, and is projected to exceed type curve by 8% over the first 12 months. Our low well cost superior well productivity, and strong price realizations for both condensate as well as natural gas mean that the economics in our Montney wells remain outstanding. Assuming $75 WTI and $2.50 NYMEX gas, we expect our Montney to generate a program-level IRR of more than 60%. Our Montney gas realized 129% of ACO and 72% of NYMEX in Q2 on an unhedged basis. This is thanks to our physical transportation arrangements to markets in eastern Canada, Chicago, California, and the Pacific Northwest. Our second quarter oil and condensate price realization was also robust at 94% of WTI. As Corey mentioned, our second quarter production in the play exceeded our expectations. We brought on 33 net wells, produced 34,000 barrels of oil and condensate, and 1.2 BCF per day of natural gas. On the condensate side, the outperformance was due to strong well productivity and some acceleration of turn-in lines. While on the natural gas side, we saw about 100 million cubic feet per day of outperformance due to well performance, post-maintenance flush production, and a favorable royalty adjustment. The outperformance was specific to the second quarter and largely one time in nature, as we expect Montney condensate volumes to track closer to the 30,000 barrels per day in the back half of the year. Our performance in the Montney continues to demonstrate the expertise of our team and our leadership position in the play. Across numerous key metrics, Oventive Screens is the top of the peer group. We have the best capital efficiency on both a BOE basis and an oil and, ga- oil and condensate basis, coming in 50 to 60% better than the peer average. Our spud to rig release time is 50% faster, we are drilling 20% longer laterals, and we have drilled 13 of the top 15 wells in the play since 2023. We are confident in our ability to continue delivering top well results in the play, generating superior asset level returns and unmatched capital efficiency. Moving to the Uinta, our significant scale and running room in the play continue to differentiate Oventive from our in-basin peers. With over a decade of well inventory, ample takeaway capacity, and margins similar to that of our Permian operations, 
The Uinta is a unique and highly competitive part of our portfolio. The refinery turnarounds in Salt Lake City were completed at the end of the first quarter, allowing us to bring constrained production back online for the duration of the second quarter. Our oil and condensate volumes totaled 28,000 barrels per day. We brought on seven net wells and now have more than half of our 2024 turn-in lines online. Our drilling program in the Anadarko began in April and is now well underway. We expect to begin bringing those wells on through the third and fourth quarters. We are targeting the oiliest parts of our acreage to leverage the strong oil performance we saw in 2023, where the wells displayed first-year oil cuts of more than 55%, but about 85% of first-year revenue coming from oil. Our oil and condensate volumes totaled 27,000 barrels per day in the quarter. With the lowest base decline rate and a modest development program this year, the Anadarko continues to generate significant free cash flow. I'll now turn the call back to Brendan. Thanks, Greg. So our team continues to build on our track record of execution. We once again met or beat all our targets, generated cash flow per share and free cash flow per share above consensus. Maximizing the capital efficiency and the profitability of our business continue to be key areas of focus across our organization. Our industry-leading efficiencies and our strong culture of innovation are truly differentiating against a maturing resource backdrop. We are well positioned to deliver superior durable returns to our shareholders through our focus on operational excellence, disciplined capital allocation, and responsible operations. This concludes our prepared remarks. Joanna, we're now ready to open the line for questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, you can join the queue to ask a question by pressing star 1. We will now begin the question and answer session and go to the first caller. First question comes from Neil Dingman at Truist Securities. Please go ahead. Um, good morning, guys. Nice quarter. Um, maybe uh, Brandon, my first question for you, Greg, uh, really on slide 10, I really like that, uh, on the Permian performance specifically. Could you just talk about, uh, shows those 42 second quarter wells obviously held up uh, very, very well. Just wonder anything different that uh, on the BNC side there, and then can you remind me uh, just sort of generally where those wells were drilled versus kind of where plans are for the remainder of the year. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Neil, appreciate that question. I'll, I'll turn it over to Greg here. You know, we, we brought on over twice as many wells in the second quarter versus the first quarter, so that really kind of gives now a, a statistical data set to look at um, year to date. Um, and really what you're seeing is a consistent um, DNC approach uh, with the wells, both geographically, but but also just how we've been completing them and drilling them. But, but I'll turn that over to Greg to fill in some of the details there. Yeah, thanks for the question, Neil. Uh, and, and really, um, it really didn't do anything different in the second quarter than we did in the first. We're uh, completing the wells the same way. As Brendan mentioned, uh, we do have wells both in the first and second quarter scattered throughout the whole of our acreage position, both on our legacy acreage and on the acquired in cap acreage. Uh, so we're just seeing uh, the result of, of what we would expect to see with a, a, an average type curve. Some of the wells come in slightly above the curve. Some of them come in slightly below the curve. But on average, we're very confident in our ability to deliver that type curve, and we feel very comfortable that we're going to deliver on it for uh, for not only the rest of this year but years to come, as we think it's a great uh, you know defining way to talk about how our program is going to deliver uh, going forward. If, um, Greg, and maybe my follow up for you as well, um, just one or even Brad, if you want to jump in, just on on completions now, not just the Permian, but but maybe talk overall. I'm just wondering what percent uh, is broader side is using trimal track, and also, um, you know, what are are you fully going to, you know, I guess you call it uh, sort of that the sand mine or sand conveyor, uh, you know, when we were out there seeing it on site, is that what you're using on every pad now? So I'm just wondering from sort of the completion side, uh, have you gone to, is that more the standard now for you all? Thank you. Yeah, no, th thanks for that, Neil. And, and yes, uh, in, in the Permian, we are continuing to uh, to execute on trimal frac. It'll make up just over half of our completions this year. Uh, we're using the uh, you know the wet sand from the local sand mines being delivered to location, uh, and using the sand piles that we've uh, we've 
pioneered in, in the Permian over the last few years. So all of that is what's allowing us to, to have these industry-leading results. It's just our focus on efficiency and logistics and, and our supply chain management, as well as partnering with some really solid industry players to help us uh, deliver these fracks. As we think about the other plays in the portfolio, uh, they're also seeing very good uh, completion uh, cycle times. Uh, in the Montney, uh, while it's a you know, different play, uh, so we have a different stage architecture there, the focus on efficiency and innovation is the same as we have in the Permian. Uh, you know, In the Permian, we're leaning on completing multiple wells at the same time to improve our cycle time, while in the Montney, we're looking at our real-time frac optimization to tailor the treating schedules to each well to optimize our efficiency there. But but in all cases, we feel like our, our cycle times are well cost and the results we're getting are industry leading. And that's just our focus on in innovation and continuous improvement and just really proud of the teams and how well they're executing right now. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. Next question comes from Arun JRM at JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning. I have a follow up on slide 11. Uh, maybe to Brendan and Greg. Uh, I was wondering if, if you could give us a sense of what you're baking in in terms of drilling and completion, um, you know, efficiency gains, and if you came to the decision where cycle times continue to maybe outperform your expectations, Brendan, would you be in the camp of, of you know, producing more at the same level of CapEx or, or, or trending CapEx down um, and, and, and to, you know, not to, to, to increase you know, your production even above what you what you raised this this morning. Yeah, I would say love the question, Arun, and and love the momentum that the team's creating here. R really, what our guidance for the rest of this year and the and the outlook that we've given for 25 and beyond, what they reflect is all the known efficiency gains that we've captured to this point, and really what the pay setters reflect is 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 what's the future potential. Um, and so, what we baked in is is the knowns and where we'd love to do is is continue to see the efficiency gains that we've seen over the last several years c continue to show up and and so we'll address that in future guidance and in annual plans as as we roll them out but but to date we've baked in everything we've got um, and and what we're highlighting with the pace setters is that you know it's physically possible to do even better than than the leading uh, efficiencies that we've captured so far. Great. And my follow-up, uh, Brendan, is just on the M&A climate, you know, continue to see a, a pretty active uh, A&D market uh, in the Permian Basin. Uh, specific question, there is, as you are aware, a large Midland Basin trade that apparently is coming with Double Eagle. Uh, I think OVV and others have been kind of mentioned in, in the press. But I was wondering if you could comment about how you think about future A&D uh, in the Permian post the uncapped transition transactions, uh, and, and just any thoughts, is there any credibility to some of these reports? Yeah, for sure, Arun. So, you know, look, I think if, it, you know, reflect in how we've been prosecuting this durable return strategy, it's, it's really let us get ahead of the competition uh, and deepen our inventory ahead of some of the price escalation that we've seen in the market. Uh, and the result is we've created a business that's really a proven free cash generator, uh, and we've been using that free cash to to both return cash to shareholders through buybacks, but also, importantly, through reducing our leverage. And that put us, it puts in a place today where we can be really disciplined and, and really just focused on executing the portfolio that we've got. And, you know, one of the things we're really pleased to see in this quarter is leverage moving in the right direction. We think that's really an important feature for us. And you look at what we've done, you know, highlighted the, the 1,650 inventory locations since 2021 uh, through a whole series of, of actions, including the organic renewal to do that, really shows that we've got a track record to build that portfolio and, and make our company better. Uh, the, the now 20% capital efficiency gain that we're seeing year over year, I think, is a great proof point of that. To your question, you know, lots of consolidation speculation one thing I'd highlight, it's, it's maybe more of a hidden trend, but it's something we think is, is actually really important. Over time, what we're seeing is that the leading operators uh, really continue to get more technically sophisticated. And the way that's happening, the sort of avenues that are driving that, it's, it's really hard to catch up 
if you haven't been stacking these innovations across your business all the way along. And, and so that leaves us in a place where, you know, prosecuting our strategy means really focus on getting better, not just on getting bigger. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Arun. Thank you. The next question comes from Josh Silverstein at UBS. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, guys. Uh, Brent, just, just sticking with the improving the balance sheet outlook, you do have a uh, $600 million maturity coming up next year. Just curious what the latest thinking is to, to address that and, and what addressing that impact the current you know, shareholder return profile of 50% post the base dividend. Yeah, hey, Josh. Yeah, thanks for the question. I'll kick it to Corey to, to talk about the maturity in 25. Yeah, good morning, Josh. I think the outlook we have for free cash flow puts us in a good spot where we can handle it within our existing framework. You know, that's a May maturity, so we've got a, a fair amount of time before that. So we're not committing to whether we have to refinance it or put it on our credit facility, but we do have enough free cash flow. We can make a pretty significant dent in that just organically. And then on the capital allocation framework, Josh, what I'd say there is, you know, we've been really clear we're we're using free cash to to drive down that leverage towards the one times target at at mid cycle prices. And I think sitting here today, as we as we make that progress, it makes sense to stay in that fifty fifty um, uh, model. And then once we get to that, is is probably a good time to take a look at well. Should it change? Is it, is it anything different? And I would just highlight, we, we've always said, it's been in the program all the way along, it, it's, it's at least 50% of free cash flow going back to shareholders. So, so I think as we, as we approach and, and get to that one times leverage, that'll be the time to, to take a look at that. Great. Uh, then uh, maybe looking at, at the Motney, there's some changing pricing dynamics up in Canada for Condensate and, and ACO with the startup of TMX and LNG Canada. Um, how are you guys positioning for the improving outlook in both? Um, will you want to open up some more exposure to, to ACO, allocate some more capital to the Condensate window? How, how are you thinking about the plan for, for, I guess, maybe back after this year and into next year? Yeah, thanks, Josh. Really unchanged on the allocation front, so we're going to continue to, to allocate our capital to the condensate window. And really what's underneath that is we believe strongly the fundamentals for condensate to remain a premium product in Canada are, are very much intact. And you mentioned the, the startup of, of Trans Mountain being an incremental tailwind to those fundamentals. And, and we continue to see the need for significant uh, condensate imports into Western Canada to su- su- supply that diluent demand from the oil sands producers, and so we see that that premium pricing staying intact on the condensate side, and then on the ACO side, we're, we're probably in in the cautious camp. So we're we're very excited and, and looking forward to seeing LNG Canada start up. We think that is going to be a real positive for Canada and Montney gas producers, but. It, it's probably not a structural game changer to ACO pricing relative to NYMEX, and, and that's just because there's a lot of gas resource in Canada. And so even taking that incremental 2 BCF a day um, off- offshore to international markets is, is going to be helpful, but probably not a long-term re-rate of ACO. And so our strategy continues to be to price diversify on the gas side and and get market access to to multiple downstream markets for our Canadian gas. And right now we're in a really great position there with with you know substantially all or close to all of our Canadian gas being priced outside of ACO. That's clearly a good thing in the current market and and. We think long-term uh, the right move. There might be transient periods where where ACO tightens in and. That, that's great as well, but but I think long term we continue to believe in diversifying aw- away from the Western Canadian market. Thank you. Next question comes from Neil Meta at Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, team. Brendan, team. Uh, just want to talk about the base decline rates in the portfolio. You talked about that in the context of the Anadarko, but they, in general, we've seen them continue to to move lower on a BOE basis. So, 
Can you talk about what you're seeing uh, um, across the portfolio that's enabling that and, and the sustainability thereof of, across the four different uh, bases you operate? Yeah, maybe I'll kick it to Greg to talk about some of the great things that our team's been doing to drive that. But, um, you know, this is a combination of both active um, base production management by our team, but also as we have stayed in this maintenance level mode over time, you get a, a declining um, a decline rate, a, a, a dropping decline rate just as that production base matures and you get further out on the on the type curves for for the for more wells in the mix, um, and so we're probably in the mid 30s on a decline rate across the whole portfolio. And then the the notable exception, which you highlighted, was the Anadarka, which is actually now uh, you know well under 20 percent on the base decline. But over to Greg on some of the specifics of how we're getting that. Yeah, just thanks for your question, and I really just want to compliment the teams on what a great job they've done just doing the daily blocking and tackling that it takes to keep these wells on and, and minimize uh, decline as well as minif minimizing uh, you know things like frack interference. That was one of the big things that we uh, benefited from with our in-cap transaction. We were able to spread out the activity across that acreage footprint, which the previous operators were not able to do, and uh, that's allowed us to uh, you know flatten that decline. Uh, but it's also the act actions of the team, just things like, uh, you know, routine brake fix, uh, optimizing artificial lift, avoiding downtime, uh, and just really planning and executing their business well and doing that across the portfolio. All of the assets, we're seeing a uh, flatter base decline year over year uh, and uh, just anticipate uh, those guys continuing to work to, uh, to flatten those base declines. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, the follow-up is just on on 25. I recognize it's early, but uh, you know, if I think about capex, you're at 2.25 to 2.35 billion this year. It's called 2.3 at the midpoint. What are the puts and takes as you think about 2025 capital that we should be keeping in the back of our minds? Yeah, I think obviously the the one that's live right now. Uh, Neil, that we're in the midst of doing is our price discovery from the service sector, um, and so that'll that'll be a really important next couple of months here as we as we get all of that in place and really understand how pricing is shaping up for 25, and um, so that could be a big driver one way or the other. Um, and you know, I, I would say generally, um, our view here is probably fairly consensus, which is given the activity levels that we're seeing. Across industry, you know, there's some potential uh, for for deflation bias, probably rather than inflation, given the market dynamics. Um, but you know, look, we got to get through that work and really understand that um, before we make anything uh, declarative. Uh, and then, you know, really the other is continued efficiency capture, and, and can we continue to drive some of the gains that we've seen over the last several years that have have resulted in a pretty substantial uh, enhancement to our capital efficiency. And so w when we put all of that in the basket today, net net, what we're what we're steering people to is this outlook of, you know, 2.3 billion dollars holding the 205,000 barrels a day of crude and condensate flat year over year, and that's the the best way to be thinking about the business as we work through the next uh, several months. Thanks, Brent. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. Next question comes from Doug Leggett at Wolf Research. Please go ahead. Uh, hey guys, thanks for uh, taking my question, um, Brendan. For I, I know there's 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 no precision here, and we we like to pretend that there is. But I want to I want to hit your comment about the seven to ten years, two point three billion dollars. I, I seem to recall at the time of the NCAP deal, uh, we were talking about we've addressed the inventory issues. We've we've gotten in front of it. The timing, obviously, of the deal was fantastic given everything that was going on, but the seven to ten years, I, I thought it was probably close to 15 plus. Can you help reconcile the gap for me? Yeah, no, I really appreciate that question, Doug, and it's quite an insightful question. You know, the what we're trying to draw a distinction there, too, is from a total premium inventory, we, we've definitely shifted ourselves into that ideal window of 10 to 15, and remember, the, the premium designation we use is, is a well that can deliver a rate of return higher than 
at a price deck of $55 WTI and 275 NYMEX. So it's a pretty high bar to be able to do that. You know, we deliberately hold a, call it a conservative view of that mid-cycle price just to create a discipline in, in how we think about that inventory depth. And so that is the, the sort of 10 to 15 um, cutoff that you're talking about. And then what we're highlighting with the 7 to 10 is if you take our current capital efficiency, this idea of can you hold 205,000 barrels a day for $2.3 billion of capital, with our current cost structure, current capital efficiencies, what we're seeing is we have an inventory that would be able to do that for 7 to 10 years. And so buried in those two things that I just told you is that we're delivering a higher program return than 35% today. And, and so the question or the transparency that we're trying to answer for our investors is, hey, how long can the business continue to deliver that, that return that you're generating today? And, and so when we compare that across the industry, that screens really well um, compared to uh, how we see peers setting up from an inventory quality and, and current capital efficiency perspective. So that's the, the transparency we're trying to illustrate for our investors. Very, very clear. Thanks uh, for that answer, Brendan. My, my follow-up is a quick one. It's uh, slide 12. I'm just curious if you can, and you don't really talk much about the well performance and the improvements you've seen in the Montney. I'm wondering if this was just an isolated area or if there was any read-through to the broader uh, portfolio quality, if you like, if, as, as this type curve seems to be outperforming your legacy wells in the Montney. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, that one as well. The, the that 15 to 28 pad is tracking above our our 24 program type curve, and just like what you saw in the Permian, we'll see uh, statistical distribution around that type curve mean in the Montney. And and so, the what we were really trying to highlight there is, hey, why was your Q2 production so strong relative to plan and relative to guidance? And you know, it's the back on the back of of two things: the 15 to 28 pad performance as well as accelerating some of the on streams in the Montney in the quarter. And so we would expect, I think, best way to plan the business is for us to continue to perform at that type curve over the rest of the year. And, you know, I would just say this is part of the relentless drive to keep making the business better. If the team can continue to find ways to drive uh, completion design that, that gives us a better type curve, we'll bake that into to future guides, but for now, the the type curve we've got there is the right one for the full year. Terrific. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Thank you. Next question comes from Gabe Dawood at TD Cowan. Please go ahead. Thanks. Morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for taking my question. I uh, was maybe hoping to get a little more color around uh, the Permian and whether or not the current uh, equipment level um, and, and just call it you know, 130 net tills a year, if that holds current volumes of 123,000 barrels a day of crude and condi flat more or less from here. Yeah, I'll, I'll flip that to Greg to, to fill in. So, uh, yes, we're uh, we're on track for the uh, for the, the same number of tills uh, that we've been been guiding to, uh, but as you recall, um, you know, we, as we came off the in-cap transaction, our, our rate was quite a bit higher than our uh, long-term run rate, and so you know, the first quarter I believe it was around. 130 in the Permian, 123 this quarter. It'll continue to, to come down slightly as it levels out in that you know 115 to 120 range. Uh, so we're pretty close to our run rate there in the Permian, but we feel like you know somewhere there, just under 120 is probably a rate that we're going to we're going to flatten out at over time for uh, for this type of activity rate. Maybe Gabe, just to fill in across the portfolio there, what we'd expect to see through the back half of the year is the money sit around 30,000 barrels a day. The Uinta and the Anadarko both sit in the high 20s, uh, respectively, and then the, the balance uh, coming out of the Permian, which, as Greg said, probably just, just underneath 120 uh, to, to get to that second-half guidance that we've, we've put out. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks, Greg. That's, uh, that's helpful. And then maybe as a follow-up, you talked about the $2.3 billion capital number, obviously, but just curious... At the asset level, you did highlight some pretty attractive pace setters from a DNC standpoint in uh, Midland and, and the Motney. Just curious 
can you talk a little bit about confidence levels and, and those pace setters representing the, the new go forward DNC figures for those two plays? Thanks guys. Yeah, the you know, I think the the perspective we've been taking on this is, you know, we like to live in the world of this is what we're delivering today and, and you don't have to believe in some future story. Um but these are the these are the results you're seeing today and then you know, I think the relentless drive we have is to try and always be converting those pace setters into averages over time. And, um, you know, we like the track record of what we've been able to do on that front. And, you know, I think it's more of a stay tuned as, as we proceed through the rest of this year and into next. But uh, but excited about what the team's delivering there on, on the leading edge. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Gabe. Thank you. Next question comes from Greg Party at RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Good morning. And I'd I, I really echo the, um, the execute, strong execution again in this quarter. Wanted to come back um, just to the UNTIN. I guess my question is, is, you know, is it core? And can you perhaps give us a sense as to how large, um, how large that segment becomes, maybe from a production standpoint over the next few years? Yeah, hey Greg. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, look, we really like the Uinta. Um it's been on a an incredible trajectory over the last year where we've doubled production. Um and and just, you know, a couple things that are really important about the Uinta, it's very oily. Um so over 80% oil on a BOE basis. And it's also very undeveloped. So over 80% of our acreage position in the core of the play is undeveloped. Um And really what the team has done, the team's really delivered that it's pretty impressive what they've accomplished on both market access, um, but also well productivity and well cost. Um, And where that's put us is is where the returns and the margins that we're generating in the UINTA are really competitive with the Permian, Um, you know, so competitive with one of the best plays in North America from a return and margin perspective. so, you know, pretty excited about what's going on. I think the way to, to expect from a trajectory perspective is is for us, if we, if we keep the company in the maintenance level, so this this outlook of, of 205,000 barrels a day, um, we would see the Uinta stay pretty flat in that. And so it, that would be in the high 20s uh, for, for barrels a day. And, and uh, we think that's the right place to... To settle that one in, we have the ability to grow it if we choose. But but if we're not growing the total company production, there's not a motive to to be growing the UINTA at the expense of, of any of the other assets. So I would expect it to stay pretty stable as we head through the back of this year and into 25. Okay. All right. That makes a lot of sense. And then maybe just a, a follow-up. I thought I heard Greg say that there was a one-time royalty adjustment amount in 2Q, and I'm just wondering... Um, how much of a volumetric impact that would have had? Yeah, it, it, it's probably. I'll just give the headline, and then Greg can fill in on the nature of the adjustment. But you know, it's probably about three quarters of the gas outperformance in in two Q, which was about a hundred million a day extra. Um, but but maybe Greg can just give a little more color on what drove that uh, royalty adjustment. Yeah, thanks, Brendan, and yeah, that's spot on. Of of the hundred million a day, um, you know the about 75% of that was the royalty adjustment. And there's two things that go into that. One, uh, as we uh, see lower commodity price, the uh, we were on a sliding scale royalty system uh, in Canada. And so with lower commodity price, we actually pay lower royalty to uh, to, the, to the crown. And, and that means that we get to keep more of the net production for, for ourselves. So that caused a, a good portion of the beat. But we also had a, a prior period adjustment uh, where we went back and looked at the uh, the actual prices being received by the uh, the average producer in the basin uh, in previous quarters, and that was lower than we had uh, projected. And so that caused a, a one-time adjustment there. So uh, I'd say probably a third of the adjustment was was you know due to low prices in the quarter, and then the PPA made up the rest. And just to close that out, Greg, what, what that effectively means is there weren't more gross BTUs produced. We just got to keep more of them uh, as a result of the split between us and the royalty owner. And uh, and then the the other thing to just recall back is that we we've, we've not allocated capital to to growing gas production. It, 
that's just an associated gas stream that's coming out of our condensate investments. Understood. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Thank you. Next question comes from Roger Reed at Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning. How are you? Yeah, great, Roger. Good morning. I just wanted to um, come back on some of the LOE guidance. I mean, understandable that volumes probably come down here in the second half of the year, so some of the LOE increase on a you know per per unit of production going up makes sense. But I was just curious, is there any Thing else we should be watching, or as you think about the range of LOE, how much is controllable and how much is just you know going to be volume driven? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Roger. I'll kick it to Greg to talk about some of the specifics here that were some of the things we've been doing to make cost control on the LOE um, really show up in the results. But but you've hit on the big feature, which is a little bit of the the per unit effects uh, on the production, but but kick it to Greg on some of the things the team's doing on LOE. Yeah, thanks for the question. And, and you know, again, just re really proud of the job the teams have done to, uh, to to push back on. You know, we've seen general deflation on, on the capital side of our business, but uh, on the uh, the expense side, the costs have been really pretty sticky uh, due to uh, you know high labor costs, and labor is a big uh, input there on the LOE side. So the teams have done a great job just minimizing the uh, you know the break fix work, uh, keeping their wells up. Uh, and online more, uh, and doing a great job with automation. Uh, we've got our operations control centers that we use to monitor the wells, to predict when they're going to come offline, and then respond quickly when they do come offline. And all of the, those things together allow us to keep the wells up more and generate more production. Uh, and that, you know, while keeping the absolute cost flat, if you're able to generate more production, as you observe, then you get a, a lower unit metric. But really just a great job of blocking and tackling from all the teams Teams across all, all four of the plays. One of the things I'll just highlight, and we've mentioned it before, but we did remove a lot of the summertime risk to high power prices in the Permian, which which we identified as a as a risk factor coming into this year. And so, we've got about 80% of our summer power needs in the Permian there um, at at firm prices, so forward priced um, that are advantaged relative to current market, and so. That, that's another feature the team did a nice job of, of getting out in front of and, and managing the potential for some, some cost inflation in our LOE structure. I appreciate that. And the other question I had was just sort of a follow-up in the Permian uh, with the Matterhorn pipeline kicking off this quarter. Any sort of immediate impacts that you would expect out of that? I mean, the most immediate impact would be the impact of Waha pricing where we have a, a small amount of exposure. It doesn't doesn't have a huge revenue influence when you think about it from the corporate perspective, but, but we do have a little bit of Waha gas exposure that we inherited with the the NCAP assets that we acquired last year. So that's probably the most immediate effect, Roger, but, but otherwise just good to see another uh, piece of pipe infrastructure built out of the Permian. There, um, you know, I don't think there's any spoiler alerts here that there will need to be more uh, in the future, but uh, good, good to see this one coming. And, um, you know, I, I think for us, um, you know, just we're, we're well insulated on the gas takeaway side at the moment, and but, uh, but helpful to have more infrastructure in the basin for sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from Kalai Akamine from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Good morning. Um, my first question is on the Anadarko. Uh, Brandon, you had mentioned that the 24 program is repeatable going forward. Uh, in that program this year, the Anadarko declines, granted, with an improving base. But wondering when that asset plateaus at the current activity set and whether this asset, which isn't consuming a lot of capital, is actually a core piece of your portfolio. Yeah, great question. Yeah, we're re really pleased to see the Anadarko performance, and, and we're really at that point now where it's stabilizing out in that high 20s uh, on the crude and condensate uh, rate, and, and that would be the, the kind of going in uh, starting point for our 25 program. And so we've got a, you know, a relatively small capital program, but maintaining a big free cash flow base, and, and that's the 
the tremendous role that the Anadarko asset is playing in our portfolio today. Um, very capital efficient. The returns compete heads up with with each of the other three assets in the portfolio, and so we'll we'll do the work here over the next several months to figure out exactly the right activity level in 25. But we think it it's it's probably going to be in a maintenance level, just like what we described earlier on the UINTA, um, where now that we've got those two programs pretty balanced on scale and performing very well on returns, um, probably makes sense to just have them stay pretty stable uh, in the portfolio over time. Uh, I appreciate that. My, my next question is also on the 25 program, which is going to be a repeat of this year. In the Permian, you guys recently added a six rig and I suppose you'll keep that running for 25. So wondering if we're setting up for a more capital efficient program because there looks to be some room for non-DNC capital to sort of roll in 25. Yeah, sitting here today with the with the efficiency gains that we've captured, and I, m- I mentioned earlier this sort of basis of the, the forward look captures all the known efficiency gains that, that we've got in hand today. We, we probably can back off of that sixth rig pace and and hold the Permian flat in 25. So, you know, don't want to get too far over our skis on the 25 program because that's, you know, really a work in progress internally at the moment. But, it, you know, that's where the numbers would shake out today if, if we looked at the tills, uh, just the sort of thousands of feet we'd need to bring on stream in 25. You wouldn't need six full rigs all year. So that could be a sometime in 25, we, we'd make that pivot back from 6 to 5. I appreciate it. Thanks, Morgan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from Nitin Kumar at Mizuho. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, Brendan and team. Um, thanks for taking my questions. Um, Brendan, I wanted to circle back on something you said about when addressing M&A, about getting better and not bigger, uh, and you alluded to some technologies was wondering if you could maybe give us a little bit more color on, are you talking about expanding recovery, expanding zones, uh, or, or other uh, technologies? Um, and what's the time um, line look like on some of those? Yeah. Hey, appreciate it. And then, I mean, you know you know us. that you, Your danger here is that we're going to talk your ear off on this stuff for, for too, too long, so I'll try and be concise. But, you know, I think I would sort of highlight a couple of things. One has been um, the approach we've been taking on data and, and really being focused on building out a private data set that is quite unique both in scope and, and specificity for some of the problems and challenges that we're trying to get after with our innovations. Um, and so we've really set ourselves up to be able to work using that private data set and get some really unique uh, inferences into what's going to drive cost reductions, but also what's going to drive well productivity over time. So, so that that's the first one, and then, and then the other features that we've talked a bit about before, um, particularly on the completion design front, the things we're doing with stage architecture, the things we're doing with uh, frac fluids to drive oil recovery, and then on the real time optimization that Greg mentioned earlier, I think those continue to be the three channels that we're seeing great returns on our efforts, and and so. When you, when you look at how these innovations unspool over time, the feature that we think is, is maybe a bit new in the last few years is how these things are stacking together. So um, how things that we can do today with trimal frac are really rooted in things we figured out how to do a couple years ago with wet sand and sand piles and, and the real-time uh, optimization stuff and how that pairs with the fluid chemistry and the rock fabric work that we're doing in the labs, and, and all of this stuff is kind of really feeding together into, into an understanding of, a, of an entire system and, and how to optimize that entire system. And, you know, that's great because what it means is there's a real sense of momentum that can be built, um, and it also, I think, is a way for, for companies like ours to see differentiation. Um, where you can drive relative pr- return performance that, that's differentiated from from competitors. So that, that's really the, like I said, I could go on and on, but that's my be- my most concise version of that discussion. 
Got it. I mean, I, I guess what I was trying to get at is that at, at some level, uh, and it's been asked in different ways on the call, um, you know, it's a, it's a matter of scale as well, and, and, and this certainly makes you better and helps you drive more margin out of um, the barrel, but how does it make you get more reserves is, I guess, what I was trying to get at. Um, just as my second question, I wanted to uh, understand, uh, we saw you add some hedges in the quarter, uh, um, and, and, and just want to talk about the, the, the long-term hedging philosophy. Um, as you approach that 1x uh, net debt to EBITDA target, do you expect to see um, a, a less hedges uh, uh, being in place, or uh, is this just something part of the DNA of Oventiv, um, and how do you think of it long-term? Yeah, that, but let me come to the hedges in a sec, but I just want to circle back to your earlier point, and, and perhaps I was too wonkish in my explanation, but I think how you're seeing this show up and making the company better is tight curves are higher year over year, and, and costs are lower, and free cash generation is up 60% uh, per share. Uh, that That's how you're seeing that all that cumulative effect of all of that flow through to the bottom line for our shareholders and and so that that's the relentless pursuit that, that we're after with those innovations. So so yeah, ho- hopefully I didn't cloud that with my with my engineering uh, details. But uh, to your hedge question, I think what we what we've always maintained, and I think it continues to be our our perspective on it is we're hedging to manage against the risk of a protracted period of, of very low prices. And as our debt comes down, um, as you're seeing it as you're seeing it do, our need for those hedges goes down as well. And so I would expect us to be in a place where we can can kind of ratchet those hedges back as we approach that leverage objective uh, with time. But today, we're, we're, we're managing it with a hedge program that's plus or minus 20 to 25 percent of volumes and using third um, three-way structures that give us um, – that price floor that we're looking for, but also retain exposure to to the upside as well. So, but but in general, that hedge program should dial back as we approach that leverage target. Great. Well, th- thanks for the patience in answering my questions. Yeah, you bet. And thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from Jeff J at Daniel Energy. Please go ahead. Hey guys, real quick one from me in terms of the difference, I guess, between sort of the average to date uh, DNC cost by basin and the pay setter uh, DNC costs. Is there service cost deflation in those figures or is that pure efficiency? Uh, those are just pure efficiency. Yeah. So they're side by side on service costs, apples to apples there. Okay, great. Thanks. That's helpful. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. And the next question comes from Dennis Fong at CIBC. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, and thanks for taking my question. Uh, most of the other questions I had uh, came from other analysts, but I did have one uh, that kind of jogged my memory with uh, one of the previous questions asked. Uh, can you talk towards some of the understanding that you have of the basins you operate in, um, especially with a focus on data, uh, and then how does that potentially kind of further inform or revise uh, the way that you adopt best practices, either in operations, cost savings, well productivity, or even land that you target, either from acquisition or swap. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Yeah, I love that question. I think the we we try and really harness the advantage of being in in several of these really high quality basins. And the the saying we have around here is the the only infinite rate of return project where we we are aware of is learning from somebody else's capital. So when one of our offsetting peers, you know, tries something new and it either works or doesn't work, um, we work really hard to learn from from what those peers are learning because you know it's their risk dollars that went into that learning and and. Like I said, it's an infinite rate of return, whether it worked or didn't. Um, and so because we're in multiple basins, we could do that across an even bigger peer set. You know, and, and then the other feature that we work really hard on is transporting ideas across uh, each of those basins and asset teams. And we've really created an internal environment where those ideas are flowing really easily and naturally ac- across the teams. And, and that lets us do things like achieve basin leading frac performance in the Permian, you know, up to 4,800 feet per day. 
and do the exact same thing in the money and, and really rapidly, you know, within several quarters, get to that efficient frontier in both places. And so really excited about that skill that we've built. And then, you know, we do see um, quite a bit of, of innovation difference across the basins. It's remarkable, actually, how much idea trapping happens uh, across these basin boundaries. And, and you know, that's just advantage us because, you know, we showed that with the Montney slide where you can see pretty large uh, differences in outcomes across, uh, you know, a relatively small group of concentrated peers. And and we really think that is related to this culture of, of sharing and, and innovation that we've built across the asset teams. Great. Thanks. And appreciate the context. I'll, I'll turn it back. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. At this time, we have completed the question and answer session, and we'll turn the call back over to Mr. Verheist. Thanks, Joanna, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Our call is now complete. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes your conference call for today. We thank you for participating, and we ask that you please disconnect your lines.